a complex cosmic tension field, and I'm naming it CTF for short, and it's really nothing but actually centuries old of Western physics ether, but obviously I renamed to give its physical, real physical engineering property, the word for it. Ether does not. There is another reason, which is that particles are excitation of the same field, which was not built into ether. That's why it needs to be a separate name. And automatically it becomes the uh, inertial reference frame okay, for, the, for our universe. And the key element is that I, from the scientific standpoint, I came across while I was at the University of Rochester Institute of Optics, studying optics, Huygens principle. And Huygens principle is secondary wavelet, which has natural propensity to expand as wave, secondary wavelet. So electromagnetic wave to become secondary wavelet at every point automatically implies the space through which light is propagating is full of energy, otherwise it could not help generate the secondary wavelets. And obviously it took me more than 50 years of courage to uh, tell my view of this. But other thing that I recognize also while studying in uh, Rochester is that waves really don't interact with each other in linear waves. They pass through each other because I was doing a lot of interferometry, holography, uh, diverse kind of uh, experiments. And obviously it's very simple, we see each other, which means that there are billions of other beams crossing right through our face-to-face -face light beam that we receive. So it's in the daily domain. And mathematically also it is built in. So there is no problem from that. And I'm also proposing other experiments that I have not been able to do yet. Uh, in fact, I proposed something to NASA twice and it was uh, rejected, of course, as I don't know what I'm talking about. But I'll show you that experiment. But I want to go through a little bit of preamble, uh, which is that uh, the recent publications, uh, Trouble with Physics by Smolin, uh, not recent actually, 2007, that's it, 30 years, but very recent, Hossenfelder, uh, Lost in Math. Uh, I was impressed reading both of those books. Uh, but uh, because of my background and thinking non-interaction of wave, uh, I was looking for, are they giving us some process that we can take and redirect positive, uh, more grounded evolution of physics? And I didn't see that. Although Hassenfelder uh, does go into sociological attempt uh, how, how we should behave. But I believe even in my 2014 book, I last chapter, I very clearly underscored that we need to become system engineers. Nature is a profoundly creative system engineer. That's why little kids are born to open and put together the things. So if we focus our attention to system engineering approach, we'll be doing better. And of course, I am very happy to say that uh, not all talks that I have uh, listened, but I will be going through again the video. I am already impressed the few that I have listened. And obviously all of you guys are really thinking openly that there is a uh, real objective universe, uh, whether humans exist or uh, vanish. We came as humans barely five million years ago, so we should not be arrogant to say that uh, if nobody is looking at the moon, is it there? That's a totally nonsensical debate to me. Anyway, I want to underscore that what limits the uh, or what confuses us doing physics and getting to the bottom is really that no sensor or instrument, whether bodily sensor or instrument, can uh, let me my I'll have to turn off my give me a moment my phone is listening 
I turned it off. Okay. Now, why we are having trouble, I think, is the these four key points. The whether our bodily sensors are human constructed, simple or ingenious instruments, they never can gather all the relevant information of any entities in the universe. Because no matter how we think, we start with partially known and compare it with a uh, unknown one. But the known one is already partial one and which we understand that we have done millions of experiments with electron or photon, we still don't understand what they are. No theory can be complete. And we know that from those who are mathematically oriented, Godel's incompleteness theorem. But for me, I don't need Godel. It, for me, it came from that no instrument can give me complete information. That's much more important for me being an experimentalist. And all working theories are necessarily incomplete based on the previous two points, because no beginning answers for a new theory can capture all the necessary postulates which are behind the real universe, which is too complex. Or in other words, the evidence-based science is never the final science. And once we are able to teach that to kids from early on, all this uh, funky alternate uh, universe or alternate facts cannot be brainwashing people. It's, so it is to me important that evidence-based science recognized openly is not the final science. It's always incomplete and it will remain so, but we'll have to keep on iterating and iterating, with focusing on understanding the process that nature executes. So that should be our goal, to visualize the invisible interaction processes. So I already said that so the physicists should really think uh, their major hat should be system engineering thinking and tie their, that is, but in other words, physics is not for the sake of physics. Physics is for the sake of sustaining human evolution for millions of years in future before we can get out to other planets because global warming is peanut. We can extend it, etc. But solar warming that will start coming over in a billion years, that's we cannot do anything. We'll have to get the hell out of here. So this is why it is important. And, and that's the reason why I'm saying that there is an urgent need for evolution process congruent thinking or system engineering thinking. Uh, that's the big thing. And in fact, at Chari's conference, he held a conference in 2009. I presented this, and so it's in his edited book. But meaning, what I want to say is that non-interaction of wave led me from the bottom up. Or in other words, there are lots of low-hanging fruits on the apple tree that we can pick up with the help of new. And it covers all branches of physics and mathematics in terms of our defining context. But today, of course, I'll remain focused on uh, first, obviously, I'll sp spend time in the beginning in the Huygens principle, how I uh, came across, and which is already there, but it's just me understanding. Then I'll spend some time on relativity, which actually to me is very important. And I'll conclude that relativity is actually slowing down our progress. I'll explain. <laughs> That's it. Two. Uh, serious statement. And uh, because of CTF, if it is stationary, then Doppler effect as originally Doppler explained, source movement creates a permanent change in the Doppler frequency shift in the medium in CTF for light and in uh, air for sound, etc. But detectors movement is apparent perception by the detectors, meaning same Doppler frequency moving already changed in CTF. A dozen different detectors moving towards it with different velocities will perceive it as different. This is very, very important, but trivially obvious. We actually dumped Doppler's original expression. In fact, I used it from undergraduate physics book uh, 
a Doppler effect for sound because nobody now dares to present back again uh, original Doppler's uh, derivation. And then I'll go a little bit into uh, particle because superposition principle is something of profound importance that again, we are goofing up with too many sophistication without being grounded. And obviously I will, as an experimentalist, I have done a lot of optics experiment, not particle, but I'll propose a particle experiment. So the first is Huygens. Uh, I picked up the pictures from Huygens original book. I was lucky that I was able to get a uh, electronic version from the web translated in English. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a German group, I'm forgetting the name anyway. It's available freely now. And there he clearly says that secondary wavelets. And then in 1817, uh, Fresnel uh, literally spherical wave, he's summing them with the aperture signal. But what they missed and what we are still most of us missing, that is a very good mathematical starting platform. That is not a natural phenomena that is Humans, mathematics invented logic correctly proposed that the waves are propagating together as long as they're expanding. So this is the correct representation of this picture. But if you want to detect, they are uninteracting. If you want to detect, you'll have to put a detector, its interaction parameter, and then the detector will carry out the square modulus operation wave by themselves, linear wave cannot execute nonlinear quadratic operation. In fact, quantum mechanics is full of operator, operator, but they forget that the square modulus, integration and detector stimulation, these are all operations. They're physical. That's why I underscored, we should think in terms of system engineering. This example simply from my lab hand quickly put together, water wave, they go, go through each other without really perturbing each other, showing waxing warning only on the location where they are crossing through each other. Oops. Where is my icon here? Okay. So you can see that they cross through each other, preserving their original propensities, only superposition waxing warning during the physical superposition this is very important. There is no entanglement. That's to me really not physics. Superposition is always local by virtue of the detector. Here the detector is the water itself because that's material. Same thing is for string. It's also done in my lab. Okay, I send out first one pulse and it reflects with pi phase shift from the anchored, and then the second one I generated, and they passed through each other. My video camera was not sophisticated enough to capture exactly what they're out of phase, but they are out of phase. I missed that between shot, but they passed through each other. But where they exactly met, okay, they neutralized their manifested position, but the energy is still in the stress stream. This is profoundly important, trivially simple, built into our equation. Why profoundly important? All the waves and oscillations, particle themselves oscillation, they are excited states of the CDF. Energy is still held in the CDF. Okay. So yes, a, a wave bundle carries the energy in terms of propagation, in terms of transportation that excites it, but the energy is still residing in the tension field. That's true for all tension field. And uh, a very simple, very undergraduate experiment, uh, I mean, uh, derivation, that is, he started Newton's second law, mass per unit length for a stretch string, okay? You take the tension and equate that with the force, and you mass per unit length okay, and the acceleration, and you put the tension, and then you derive the 
uh, wave equation v squared equals to t over sigma. So I did that back calculation by following this. I took mu per unit length, the magnetic resistance or magnetic inertia because electric vector, when you start developing, it immediately start uh, producing magnetic field or in other words, magnetic field is in a way generation takes energy. So it is in a way resistance or inertia. So mu delta X is the inertia and the uh, inversion of the uh, epsilon naught, I call the dialectic tension. And instead of dial epsilon naught as a constant, inverse is the tension. And again, then I derive very similar equation. Of course, Maxwell derived by using his brilliant uh, differential calculus skill. But the physics you get is that epsilon naught inverse is the electric tension in CDF and mu naught, which is being generated the moment you try to uh, create uh, the electric field, it, you are also generating the magnetic field. So it is a resistance. And that physics comes out from very simple undergraduate emulation. So for regular mass we call, we know equal to mc squared, m equal to uic squared, but here I want to underscore that c is not a fundamental constant of nature. It is a beautiful constant, obviously, but more fundamental constants are epsilon and mu naught, which were derived before Einstein's father was born, I believe. Okay, so we need to stay focused on that. Or in other words, mass, that inertial behavior is coming out of the existence of particle from the intrinsic property, the two tensions that we understand epsilon and mu naught. But I use the word complex because we still do not understand so much about the CTF. And obviously for ultimate field, the inertia is coming from magnetic field generation, which is a little bit different than particle. And so elementary particles to me, even though I'm not mathematically skilled enough to give you proper, but in my vision, it is donut or uh, torus-like electromagnetic wave propagating on itself, self-looped. So it creates a localized donut and that in phase, in free space, that torus or donus creates the, originates the quantum behavior in nature out of continuous field that we still do not understand. But the quantum mechanics or the quantum behavior in nature naturally emerges because you need in phase. And I derive the understand that from again, laser resonator, okay? It has to be in phase to generate a longitudinal mode. So in space, stability will require self loop torus like oscillation. And it automatically gives you new Newton's first and second law. First law is that once it is self loop, the tension field, and let me step back a little bit. Why does, what is the propensity for wave propagation? It's built into our wave equation because the tension field, when it is perturbed, it wants to come back to its original state of equilibrium. Only way it can do because it cannot reabsorb the energy itself. That mechanism is not there. So it pushes it. And the next door neighbor say, why did you disturb me? I was in state of energetic nirvana. I want to stay there. So the next one also pushes to the next. This propensity of tension fields coming back to its original state of equilibrium, he creates perpetual wave of propagation of wave once you generate it, unless it has resistance. And I believe even CTF has some resistance based on all the other particles and waves that's going everywhere. That's a different physics that needs to be developed that relates with the uh, cosmological redshift I'll mention a little bit later. And second law is again obvious, you need to create some potential gradient in the CTF around the particle so that it will move because the CTF itself is saying, I'm pushing it away permanently, I mean, indefinitely. So I don't need to worry about it. So it is staying right there until you bring 
another gradient built into the same CTF, okay, so that it responds to that gradient. Or in other words, to me, all the forces have to be different kinds of potential gradient introduced by these resonant or quantum particles. And if you look at Schrodinger's equation, it's really not a wave equation, okay? Because we cannot move the particle, even though particle has oscillation, and I'll use that in particle diffraction, that it can, psi for a free particle can be used as a, a plane wave. By the way, plane wave doesn't exist in this universe. It's impossible because it's either, it violates the conservation of energy. But if you add, if you add the potential, oh, my pointer, I am, oh, okay, I got it. Without this potential gradient in the CDF, I cannot move the particle, okay? So I'm, come, I'm showing that in a simple way, how things fall into place once you accept CTF. And this is a trivial uh, uh, kids experiment that why field, uh, okay, when I put south, south or north, north, one magnet is floating over the other, which means that both gravitational and magnetic fields are there, even though I can uh, pass a wooden knife without perturbing, but a steel knife snaps them together. So material composition, they change the curvature of the space. And so I like Einstein's general relativity, but I think special relativity is actually holding us back. Okay, now coming to the relativity related experiment. It is what, uh, since the slides has all the details, I'll go through very quickly to save time so that you guys can ask a lot of questions. It is important, we know very well in today's optical engineering, fiber optic communication, etc. But what it comes out that Michelson somehow missed is that pointing vector of the wave or the secondary wavelets of ligands, that, that propagation is dictated by the medium. Since material medium is built out of, again, oscillation of the tension fields when we assemble together, because of that already moving uh, light waves in self-loop, the effective index or rather effective tension is reduced, so the velocity is reduced. But the key point I want to underscore is the pointing vector is trapped by the medium through which it is propagating, even for air, which Michelson did not take into account, okay? Because he took a lot of care in his big table to enclose so that air will not be moving, so his fringes are stable, but light was trapped, pointing vector was trapped by his, by the air in the lab. So there is no way light can travel in the triangular space. Even if I think in terms of the, uh, say, right away motion due to um, Earth's velocity around the sun, 30,000 kilometer per second, okay? So I can imagine the interferometer is moving, but the air is also with it. So air has trapped, the light only goes up and down and right and left with equal path. So the null result is trivially obvious and it should be. That does not either prove or disprove uh, whether ether exists or ether is dragged or not. This is totally uh, irrelevant experiment because missed by Michelson, I mean, a master interferometer, he invented and so many things. So I don't want, but in those times it was difficult to appreciate that. So I'm not, uh, his brilliance, I'm not undermining at all. I'm, I'm looking at more than hundred years uh, future with so many other new knowledge. Okay, so I mean, but I did carry out an experiment, Fresnel drag in my lab on a completely turntable that I can turn uh, actually literally 360 degrees. I used, uh, by the way, Fizo did the experiment of Fresnel drag by putting a uh, Mark Zender-like interferometer, but 
two-way propagation. Water was pumped through a tube and he measured Fresnel uh, uh, prediction very well. But the material or the water with 1.3 refractive index was moving. And Fresnel's original uh, computation or the theory was that is the moving dipoles creates a modified uh, tension field. Okay, so light becomes partially dragged. By the way, Panofsky and Phillips gave a very nice detailed derivation of that. So it's a totally classical phenomenon, nothing to do with relativity. It's the assembly of dipoles, because what I did, I took a big glass block, and in one arm, free air, the other arm, they're going through the glass, okay? And I matched the path, so their path difference is zero, including the uh, extra path in the glass 1.5 index. Then I rotated it from east-west to west-east, very carefully on a uh, floating table, okay? And by calculation, Fresnel drag, I should have had 40 fringe shift. There was none to be observable. What it means is that there is, there is no relativity question. It's literally classical phenomena. If the material chunk moves with respect to the complex tension field, which is everywhere in the universe, okay, because particles themselves are also, then only you will get a modified tension and modified velocity and it is being dragged. So I propose this experiment to NASA and to you guys now. Uh, so I realized that the number of air molecules per lambda cube will determine whether the pointing vector or the light wavefront is being dragged by the air molecules or not, or the totally free CTF. It has to be, in my viewpoint, at least on the par lambda cube, no more than one. And today's, uh, if I, I did not get my student who is now gone with his PhD, I asked him 10 to the minus nine, I thought would be enough. People have gone up to 10 to what minus 10 also now available. Uh, NASA has and several countries now have those who are going to space because they need to do experiment. So if I have, a detector array, which is cheap, a uh, few hundred bucks at best. And I have a uh, LED, which is pumped by a sudden pulse of picosecond pulse. And if I have, say, I'm in the lab, uh, full of air and detector array, nobody has doubt that the pulse will arrive at the center because air has trapped it. That is our routine observation. Okay, but if I put it into the uh, super vacuum chamber on Earth and assume that now the Earth's uh, velocity, I orient it in such a way that now I pick up the Earth's velocity and it is really super vacuum city CTF. And this now this box is moving against CTF, then they will shift and it's really two meter long tube uh, can easily give me uh, 30 micron or so, which is the pitch now available. In fact, pitch has become even better, 10, 10 micron. Or if I sent it to the satellite, which is even better, then if I orient the satellite in such a way that my box is oriented orthogonal to the satellite velocity, then again, the CDF will trap because I'm now super high vacuum in space and it pointing vector will try to go straight up, but my box has moved and now I'll have a shift. So it can be done both on ground super vacuum and in space. And we can literally determine whether on the surface of the earth, CTF is dragged or not. And in the deep space, whether CTF is real or not. That experiment, uh, I'm a little bit frustrated that uh, NASA did not care at all, twice I tried. I'll have to figure out how I can get some private funding. Anyway, uh, I'm still working on that. The, the CTF has serious impact on special relativity because first I want to underscore that the uh, 
the two major uh, postulate of uh, special relativity. It really, Roma derived the velocity of light, even though not so precise as later we know. But his assumption clearly was that light from the moons of the Jupiter was coming with the same constant velocity in the space. And Fraunhofer already identified dark lines from stars and sun, actually sun, Fraunhofer, that uh, those are uh, same as in laboratory absorption spectrum. What automatically he was also then assuming laws of physics are same everywhere. So I don't need special relativity paper to understand this, it was already there. And to me, it's 4D real. No, to me, universe is 3D. I wouldn't go through very much detail. CDF is 3D. Only point is this. Running time is not an engineering or operative parameter of any object in this universe. Time is a brilliant uh, construction of human ingenuity. The what is real engineering parameter in the universe is frequency. Frequency can be dilated, frequency can be uh, contracted, but not running time. We very smartly inverted the frequency, got a time interval delta t, and keep on counting many, many cycles or frequencies, how many time, and then we keep on increasing the time interval longer and longer and developed a beautiful concept of running time, but that's beautiful human imagination. Now, jumping to Doppler effect. The, as I mentioned very early, uh, Doppler effect has two phenomena, Doppler. One is that real physical frequency shift because of the source movement in CTF. And there is apparent Doppler shift when detector moves through the CTF and picks up at different rate the uh, uh, waxing and or not waxing or anything, but the peak and trough of electromagnetic wave passing through. So the Doppler effect, first we, I have already mentioned that, so I do not need to, only thing is I put it here a little bit ahead of time. CMBR, if you see in the expanding universe, I have serious problem to maintain C equals constants in this space for billions of years, same velocity. I can't maintain that if it is expanding universe. So I have serious problem with that. Now I'm back, that is how I realized that Doppler effect has nothing to do with relativity. It's everything to do with what originally Doppler said. And I should not try to make it difficult, sophisticated math, okay? As I look at gas laser tube, Okay, in fact, Einstein, with his process-driven thinking about emission and absorption, while he derived AB coefficient, he clearly thought through the processes. If this atom is excited, emitted as a stimulated emitting signal while it is moving, then to me, light. Oh, I forgot to put that slide. To me, light is quantum mechanically. Uh, why is my pointer moving away? Because my hand moves. Okay. Uh, so stimulated emission jet happening, that's a uh, signal is coming out as H nu. I didn't put the graph here, obviously, because quantum mechanics is fundamentally correct. But it immediately emerges as a wave packet, like you drop a stone to break the surface tension of water surface. Same thing is atomic molecule dipoles doing it, or radio antenna doing it, perturbing it and producing uh, electromagnetic wave in the space in the CTF. Now, as the wave packet with new frequency as H nu is propagating, it is encountering, say, another excited state atom. The only way, only way the, this atom being stimulated could emit a stimulated emission, provided 
the vectorial velocity of the previous stimulating atom and to be stimulated atom are vectorially identical the direction and strength. And now I also idealize that these atoms, the space in between the atoms is the same CTF space that the atoms in the corona or the domain through which white light is being emitted in the star. Those atoms and molecules are floating, moving in the same CTF. And obviously that's why laws of physics or quantum mechanics is correct for star and us, okay? And I wouldn't go through the detail how this emerges. Uh, uh, I was going through those steps, but those are undergraduate math. But the key thing is that if I, uh, the detector, if the source was moving and detector is moving, then the Doppler's original uh, computation is like this, where I'm now assigning the quantum mechanics for an atom, okay, it can only produce new sub QM, okay, new sub QM, that's the, I'm trusting quantum mechanics as a much a better theory than uh, relativity, okay, and so when the, my computer is playing game, okay, uh, so when these two velocity, source original velocity, which does not exist anymore as far as detector is concerned, and the uh, detector, when they're identical vectorially, then it comes down to the new frequency. So there I derived the concept that, okay, I can now put a high resolution spectrometer in space and put a, uh, forget those details or basic math and repeat. If I put a satellite on a steep elliptical orbit around the sun, and from NASA's data, I find out the star whose velocities have been determined in such a way that the Doppler shift can be measured. Then at the right moment, I target my telescope and the spectrometer to the star, okay? Knowing previously that approximately the velocity vector, I match it up on my orbit and speed. If, if it is somewhat less, I probably, I mean more, I probably would go there, etc. okay? Then my spectrometer is now tuned. I choose ahead of time a specific emission line from an atom or molecule for that star. And when that emission line is now comes and matches on my calibrated spectrometer, exactly new sub QM. And at that moment, the velocity vector of my satellite is the velocity of my star. Okay, and again, this can be done by Europe, Japan, US, they have plenty good settled. In fact, I tried with uh, India, India also has, but of course they have dumped me because uh, I'm talking about beyond my brain. Okay, so the key thing is that uh, the, I want to underscore now another thing that comes out from the Doppler shift and the laws of physics same everywhere in the star and here, the redshift simply cannot be Doppler effect period. It simply cannot be, okay? Absorption spectroscopy on earth with white light, I pick up the absorption line. From a distant star, since I cannot send my satellite to a star, I cannot measure in proximity like I do here. But very far out, I'm detecting, okay? the absorption is taking place, white light from inner pickups. Notice that this absorption line is same width, okay? That's because the Maxwell-Boltzmann and the temperature measurement is still valid. Physics laws are same in both places, in my tube and on that star, okay? But Doppler shift, I mean rather Hubble's redshift is much bigger, much, much bigger, okay? Whereas the line width of the dark line remains the same as on the earth, okay? So Doppler shift or rather cosmological redshift is something other than 
Doppler shift. And as I said that I have serious problem with expanding universe, okay? So only postulate I have is that there is some resistance and energy loss through which frequency loss. In fact, I was trying to do some experiment with water wave that whether it's actually as it is propagating because of the uh, water surface resistance, its uh, wavelength is automatically increasing. I did see that, but I could not take quantitative data. Uh, two of us, with my colleague, did went down to a nearby lake and tried to snap picture by putting stakes so that the with a measured distance we can find out. But my uh, hunch is that really CTF has the for light some uh, some resistance that increases the wavelength automatically through but very small coefficient, Hubble's constant, of course, uh, defines that uh, as it propagates through very large distance. But I still have to figure out how to experimentally do that. Okay, so now the particle model, and there again, I'll uh, dwell on my personal expertise on optics and optical interferometry or optical diffraction. Uh, these are two measured fringes. This is a uh, beautiful laser coherent light, okay, and double slit and sink square envelope and cosine square fringes underneath. And notice that because of high coherence, I can get literally fringes to be zero. The key thing I want to underscore right away if I, so that I don't forget, is that the dark fringe location is not, is not is not, I repeat, due to non-arrival of photon. I am sure of that particles experience since I did not do it. I cannot claim that forcefully, but I believe it is same thing. It is because the detecting detector molecule at that location are unstimulated because of the arrival of out of phase light wave for for these dark fringes. So the silver halide molecules are currently CCD uh, arrays. They are, even the light is passing through, but passing through up vector and down vector neutralized. So the dipole cannot be excited. It cannot absorb the energy from the field. And so it reports, I am in dark, even though light EM wave energy passing right through. I believe that I can apply that same postulate to particle. This is a neutron diffraction double slit by done by a very famous guy. Oh, I forgot to put the name. Uh, he's still alive. One of the top person on particle diffraction. Uh, I'll, if I remember, I'll tell you. Sorry, I forgot to put. Anyway, the key point I'm saying that Huygens gave us the physics of spreading of wave which is his secondary wavelet. So the diffraction spreading of wave is automatically built into the wave equation itself. In contrast, particles will stay same place. It's localized, but if you give him some thermal or other way kinetic velocity, then only it moves, but otherwise it cannot change its direction. It will remain same direction, whatever has been given. But if I put an arrow slit and it gets scattered by physically and the neighboring field, then it will be scattering, but that scattering is Gaussian. So we are trying to do some computer analysis of the particle diffraction envelope and the envelope of optical, which already we know sink square, but this looks to me a Gaussian envelope. Okay, but I have not done the quantitative yet. We are trying to do that. So now let me go a little bit more, is that I take Schrodinger's equation seriously because it has done so many good. So a free particle is not a plane wave because e to the power i omega t can analyze a physical macro pendulum, a physical macro LCR circuit system, or a particle also. So I am saying that particle has internal oscillation, kinetic oscillation. So exponential, 
I am showing just i e t over h cross. I rewrite that uh, f kinetic. I forgot to put the k sub. Is it has a kinetic frequency rather than de Broglie wavelength, so I call it de Broglie frequency. Okay, where kinetic energy is h f k particle is has some oscillation. Okay, and that provides the amplitude, and that is equal to half m squared. We know, and the other strength I gather is the lambda equal to h by p of Broglie. If when v is zero, lambda becomes infinity. That's an unphysical presentation. So, it's the basic postulate is not wrong, but I'm saying that wavelength is not the primary parameter. Again, I'm underscoring primary parameter is a important primary parameter is frequency so it should be anchored to frequency meaning the particles have real frequency as they move that frequency increases and how to de describe that detailed frequency for a particle that's why you guys theoreticians are much more powerful than me and some of you have already started making uh, electron shape etc but to me intrinsic torus like oscillation frequency which gives so called inertial m0 is different from this kinetic frequency fk so there are two different motion that i am strongly postulating one is its existence self loop in phase another one more like say a spin or something because then i can write superposition principle sum of amplitude, but as I said that this is not an observable phenomenon. This is right start. I have two amplitude, two phases, four different parameters. A single elementary particle cannot carry simultaneously four parameters. Impossible. So right there I dunk single particle or single photon interference. Not only that, I detect no matter particle or photon the superposition principle is a quantitative nonlinear process carried out by detector. By the way, when the detector's frequency resonance is different, it would not pick up resonance. If you put extra beam on silicon detector, it will say, I don't see anything because chi did not resonate. Okay, so this clearly tells me that single photon, single particle interference, if I believe in mathematical logic, which I have a lot more trust than the, conjects, than the conj human conjectures we do uh, to uh, understand ourselves. You hear a simple experiment. Oh, I'm already almost an hour. Uh, I did long time ago, I think uh, 1975, 76. Yeah, 76. Uh, since I was hearing a lot while uh, in Rochester that uh, if you detect, if you try to detect which slit the photon went through, you destroy the interference. To me, that's a ridiculous statement. Duh, because only way you can detect a photon by absorbing it. So naturally, you destroy. So that is not the right question. Right question is that can you identify that real physical signal is passing through each slit. And I did a lot of holography as a student, so I set up a holographic setup. I recorded one slit at a time by blocking one at a time a high-resolution holographic plate. First, I recorded the directly the fringes here, which is this one. And then I replaced that by high-resolution photographic plate to record as a hologram. Then I block this completely with same setup, same hologram there, reference beam, and I generate all it means that, in fact, there are double exposure holography technique where you can, if you use different reference beam, you can then develop both slit one at a time also through hologram. But in other words, signal through each slit is going through, they're physically real, they're arriving here, and the what is happening is that for light also, you can use same expression, only Fk will be replaced by nu for light. And this square modulus operation remains identical. Chi becomes photodetector's uh, parameter. And so, or in other words, that uh, those are 
step of the holographic math, trivial. Uh, you can so my point is that real signals are arriving. If they arrive out of phase, then it is not there. By the way, this is nobody has produced perfect visibility differences with particle. That's because the arrival of non or rather out of phase particle in a random scattering cannot come always in pairs. So there'll always be some individual which are arriving without out of phase pair. So they create the detection. That's my postulate to explain these very low contrast fringes. Besides, we are looking at how to measure how different it is this envelope from Gaussian to sin square. We'll be doing that, not done yet. And the other experiment that I propose, I do not have the capability, but people who are, have done uh, uh, the particle diffraction experiment is if it is Gaussian, then do the experiment not with electron because electron is lost forever on the detector plane, but use a rubidium atom gun, okay? And then carry out the experiment. Then I have not yet settled on a detector. I'm trying to find out what detector will be able to absorb the rubidium atom in location unmoved, okay? Because then what will happen, this particular detector will register while rubidium atoms are mostly out of phase and it will give dark fringe and while they are mostly in phase will give bright fringe. And then if I can develop that uh, system such that I have preserved the rubidium atom without losing them, but otherwise the dark bright fringes, the exposure is already there, then with uh, white light, I should see the same fringes because rubidium has no part in it, minor part. Then separately, I illuminate with resonant rubidium radiation and it will give me a Gaussian distribution because rubidium is everywhere. I would love to see that experiment being done. Again, I don't have money to do that. Okay, and as I said that 100% of the energy resides in the cosmic tension field, and uh, because only five, six percent electronegative wave and particle oscillation in CTF are manifest, the enormous amount of energy is remaining unmanifest. Un Again, logically to me is obvious. We need enormous amount of energy to remain unmanifest, so it provides a stable platform for the dances of electromagnetic wave and the particles. If it becomes, if we manifest energy dances become too much, then the base will start becoming unstable. So to me, it's logical that we find almost 94, 96, 95% as manifest energy. So the strength of uh, CTF is, is a very powerful option as a possible platform for a unified field theory. Stationary CTF is the inertial reference frame for the cosmic system. So we do not need to worry about in which system, which, which Cartesian or whatever system, okay, it is working. We have the inertial system CTF, okay. So we do not need to worry about, besides realize this, no star or planets can provide us with an absolute inertial system because they are moving in all sorts of uh, curved path, which means they have some uh, acceleration in a way, the way we have derived our math. CTF naturally accommodates the two postulate of special relativity, which I have mentioned, so I really do not need separately SR, okay? CTF accommodates Newton's first and second law by virtue of the definition how particles emerges and exist. Perfect resonance gives you the uh, highly stable like electron and proton and partial resonance means they have finite life and how bad resonance means they die out very quickly, okay? So again, quantum mechanics emerges naturally and the life, okay? 
those who claim that the what about the uh, lifetime increases for uh, pi mason or muon i'm forgetting not being a particle physicist that the life coming down from the being created in the upper atmosphere i took nuclear physics in 1963 sorry okay anyway to me because of the kinetic velocity and this so when they are intrinsically partially stable not perfect resonance like bicycle in high speed motion becomes more stable so the semi stable particle becomes more stable for longer period of time ctf brings out em waves and particle as defined excitation which is already you have gone through ctm accommodates the basic tenets of quantum mechanics without any problem because the particles are resonant which is the core of quantum mechanics and anything else would be done when theoretical physics can pick up the structure of real structure of particles from out of ctf and best of all it helps bring back the hard causality of, of mathematics which we really depend so much but i want to underscore that the logic of the universe is not the same as logic of human in invented math we are finding here and there matching and i give the analogy that uh, put a 3 4 year brilliant kid with the global map puzzle and invert all the pieces but give on the scale on the screen a big world map and ask the kid to uh, put the puzzle together all inverted no picking within half an hour he will probably get the boundaries of most of the world australia madagascar complete complete uh, uk complete etc ceylon complete or uh, sri lanka because the boundary pieces are unique in shape but the internal pieces of the puzzles are only four or five different so nature also has a only few different forces right now we know only four forces and so we can create ourselves match a particular segment of the extremely complex universe with few laws that may not even exactly map the cosmic logic so human logic even though when a theory is working we are closer to reality for sure like quantum mechanics classical mechanics and so on okay but it doesn't mean that we have captured an obvious example is that neither general relativity nor newton's relativity can explain the velocity distribution curves of hundreds of galaxies that uh, nasa funded people have already drawn where the the velocity distribution with radial distance from the center of the uh, galaxies vary many many different way i didn't put the slide okay they vary neither gravitational theory or general relativity nor newton can explain that but that doesn't mean those are wrong they have captured many other things because we for example nasa or other space agencies they do not need to utilize general relativity to send rockets all the way to pluto and going through all the complex maneuvering taking uh, extra jolts from jupiter to go farther out all those newton's laws give so correct theory does not necessarily mean it has captured complete reality complete reality is will continuously keep on challenging us so i should quickly finish uh, i think i am keeping one hour given the late start i'll i'll read out from there so that i do not goof out the non interaction of wave is a general property of all linear waves which triggered me to start thinking uh, all these along and obviously got strength from huygens process driven thinking because he visualized the process of wave propagation ctm is the 3d so uh, to me the universe is 3d okay uh, i i i'm not going into detail there are many other mathematical logic I'm just briefly throw out i have in my uh, 2014 book that uh, the 
in fact, it was triggered to me again when I was a graduate student, that space-based Fourier transform with wave propagation through a lens is because Huygens principle morphs into Fourier-like integral in the far field. But time frequency Fourier theorem, there is no supporting physical postulate or physical principle. So a pulse, light pulse, if you trigger a pulse from a CW laser by chopping it, you do not produce new frequencies. I'm sorry, I have done enough experiment, many different way. You do not produce, but it does give you broadening in the spectrometer. And I have also derived the time pulse spectrometric classical theory, why it broadens. It is not Fourier frequency. Light wave does not generate new frequency going through a, a linear spectrometric system. So math-wise, there is also a lot to learn for us. The, uh, in fact, the third point I should have pointed out and put numbers. The velocity of light is constant everywhere in the space. The laws of nature are everywhere the same. These are the properties of the same CDF. We do not need uh, SR. Null MM experiment I have explained that that should be the result, but I have proposed experiment how to find out. We have not determined the drag uh, issue yet, even though I strongly believe CTF is real. CTF being the medium in space, the Doppler effect is, as I said, that one is uh, physical Doppler shift when source moves, and the other one is apparent Doppler shift when the detector moves. Expanding universe uh, troubles me because then F0 not mu not uh, of the tension field should be changing. Uh, I have not thought through enough to challenge the existing theories. And special relativity essentially is to me an unnecessary burden heading towards unification. Running time, as I mentioned earlier, is not a physical parameter of anything physical, okay? The, whereas frequency is, frequency can be dilated, frequency can be contracted, I, we know how to do that. Okay. So that's the key takeaway from my talk. And now I should open myself up uh, for question and answer.